Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Gospel Church's Sunday morning streaming service. Oh, welcome to everybody in the sanctuary this morning. Yes, that is the sun out there that's blinding you. Sort of, sort of unique. Let's open a word of prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for the beauty that you give us this during the winter. Lord, we're blessed with the diversity of, of seasons up here. It's all through you, Lord. If we stop and think about how you make all things possible. All we can do is thank you, praise you, and bow our heads before you, Lord. For you are truly awesome in every sense of that word. We thank you that you care for us, Lord. That you look over us, that you heal us that you are there for us, regardless of circumstances, Lord. We ask that you would show your mercy upon those that are hurting, on those that are lonely, on those that think that nobody cares, because you truly care. Thank you so much, Lord. And we ask you to continue blessing us in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's praise and worship this morning.
temples, Lord, so that those that do not know you, Lord, would see your light shining through your church, Lord. Let your glory fill this temple, Lord. You are worthy. You are a holy God. You are worthy of all of our praise. You are worthy of all of our lives, Lord. Let us lay down our lives unto you, Lord God, for you are holy.
Some of you may not share my joy at the first one I'm going to mention, but uh, just thinking how grateful I am to live in this beautiful place called Ely or Babbitt or Barris, uh, Tower surrounding area of the Iron Range. Um, I mean, where else, you know, people travel from other countries to northern Minnesota with the hopes of seeing a wolf for one time in their lifetime. I've had people sending me pictures of wolves in their backyard lately, you know. How many amens can I get for that? I think it's kind of cool, actually. But dog sledding, and yesterday my family was out with the neighbors, and they were... Uh, uh, making ice for the ice house. So in other words, they were cutting blocks of ice out of the lake and filling up the, just the things that you can do in this area. Amen? Amen. Let me pray really quickly, and then if some ushers would come, we'll receive an offering. Heavenly Father, let's see. Mindful of those with surgery recuperations, Lord, give them good ones. Give them good ones, Lord. Put spring back in their arms and in their steps, Lord. May they go walking and leaping and praising God. No resurgeries, Lord. And Heavenly Father, just mindful of a number, unique number of situations, I guess I could call them folks that are brokenhearted and crying out to you. Lord, do what you promised. Be near the brokenhearted. Make it better, Lord. Be the balm yourself by your presence, I pray. And Heavenly Father, thank you for the widow and widower's lunch yesterday. Amen. Yeah, what a... I just thank you, Lord, that there's so much life there. But these are people looking forward and not behind them. They're still living their lives for the glory of God. And I pray, God, that you would give them strength to the end. In Jesus' name, amen. And Heavenly Father, thank you for those that express their love towards you with an open hand and a soft heart. I pray that your blessing would be upon every gift and every giver. In Jesus' name, amen. And kids, after the offering, you can stand up. I'm going to dismiss you today. We have a husband and wife teaching you. And they're looking forward to receiving you downstairs for Children's Church. And so kids, you can stand up when the offering plates go past you. You can stand up when the offering plates go past you. And on the count of three, you know what to say. One, two, three. I love Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. And he loves you. I'm not going to say names. There's a few that you could pick from, but one of the young ladies in the church... Uh, scored a new school record in three-point throws. Yeah. My, my understanding is got, got the school record for the most consecutive three-point baskets in a game. And uh, in Ely, Minnesota. It's, it's not the school record, it's the, it's the state record. The state record. Yeah, and just out of little old Dealey, uh, one of our skiers won this in the individual competition, won the state ski competition and stuff. So. Small but mighty, amen? amen? 
Okay, and I got to say one for Parker. I wasn't able to be there. I was at the widow's lunch, but I heard at least in one of his competitions, he won the hot shot contest yesterday. <laughs> We rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. We do both and. There truly are some broken hearted. If you know of some of those situations, please be in earnest intercession before the throne. Their hearts are breaking, not for themselves, but for loved ones. And, um, and then, uh, but then with every bit of gusto, let's rejoice with those that rejoice, amen. amen. I, I got a kick out of the father when I, when I saw about the, the, the state record. I got a kick out of the father. He says, it must be your mother's genes or something <laughs> like that, or mother's genetics or whatever. Uh, in any event, so God bless you. Uh, we're going to talk about loving God this morning, part two. I'll give just a little bit of introduction enough to catch it back up or so there's continuity with the first message from a couple of weeks ago. First, let me pray. Heavenly Father, the word of God tells us in a couple of places, and we just know it in our heart to be true, that you are love. That you are love, that your most fundamental attribute, your most fundamental virtue is love. And not any kind of love but agape love, loving kindness, um, enduring love, unmerited love, love that flows from you as a source and fountainhead. And Heavenly Father, we can't love unless we receive from the source of love. And so your word goes on to say, that we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. And Heavenly Father, I pray it would never end that we would dynamically, experientially, daily know your love, interact on, with you on the basis of love, and that we would believe that love and have confidence in that love and never doubt that love. <clears throat> For those of us that are shepherds in whatever sphere as parents, as small group leaders, Bernie and I and soon Marty as pastors, in whatever sphere, Emmett is young life leader and the leaders with him. Heavenly Father, more and more I pray that according to your word, that you would expand our heart and that we would hold all those in our heart with deep affection and that we would yearn for them with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you would fill overflowing our hearts that you would fill to overflowing our souls that you would fill to overflowing our minds that you would fill to overflowing our strength with the love of God that you would pour love abroad into our hearts by the power of of the Holy Spirit and that you would fill to overflowing, that a river would flow to our neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Any message on love, God's kind of love especially, any message on love needs to start with the fact that God is love. The Bible tells us that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, and 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. And so as much as most sermons on love would start with the idea of loving God and loving our neighbor, 
we oftentimes forget that there's something that precedes the command, and that's that God is love himself. And that if we don't come to know and believe the love that God has for us, we will never be able to love him, at least with agape, God's kind of love, and we'll never be able to love our neighbors in that way. So we start with the fact that God is love. And before we ever touch, again, let us progress. And, or let me say it this way. And before we ever touch or progress in the idea of loving others or God himself, we need to first experience the love of God, to come to know it and believe it. We see that in 1 John 4, 16. God is always previous. God always goes before anything good. Um, what does it say even of our salvation that no one comes unless the Father draws, amen. God is always previous. We love because he first loved us. First John chapter four, verse 19. And I want you to see it in a different way, the same idea. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, if you would go there, because it ties it intimately to the point I'm trying to make here, that until God's love acts on us, we'll never be able to act in loving him or others. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. This is such an encouraging verse. I've just been praying it uh, at every prayer meeting and often in my private devotions lately. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And I love this next part, that you may truly live, amen? amen. And that circumcision of heart in other places, it talks about it as being more than a circumcision, it talks about it being a heart transplant. It says, in many places in the prophetic that God will take away the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. It's the idea of the new birth, amen? And, it's, and, and truly, in the best way, we can love with familial love, we can love with, um, we can love with a certain romantic love, we can love with a certain brotherly or sisterly love, you know, just because we're created in God's image. But until God actually changes our heart, we're not really properly able to love with agape love, God's kind of love, everlasting love, enduring love, steadfast love. And we get an idea of that there. God needs to act on the human heart if we're ever going to be able to love him back and to love our neighbor. Do you see that? <coughs> and so our own agape love back to God and flowing to neighbor starts with God first working on our heart with love. In the first sermon, I spent a fair amount of time. I gave, I think, at least a dozen different ways that God manifests his love towards us, his children, his beloved. And those are worth meditating upon because if we're not receiving and meditating and drinking deep and again, knowing and believing the love that God has for us, we'll never really progress in love, you know, flowing from our own hearts. It starts with understanding how well he's loved us. Because in reality, 
God's love has to come from God. He is the source. He's the archetype of it. He, this is the better word picture. He's the fountainhead of it. There's one fountain for God's kind of love, and it's him himself. And any time that we ever act in agape love, it has to come from God himself, even the love we give back to him. There's some other folks in the congregation today, and so I'll just repeat the quick story I told about my grandmother. It's the idea of, it's the idea of if we don't receive love from God, we can't even love him back. And some people would say, well, then how is that sincere? Or how is that if we have to get it from him in order to love him back? And why would we even do that if we got it from him? And I told you this story about Christmas time going on the bus with my grandma downtown St. Paul. And I saw this little gift that I wanted to give her. And I said, Grandma, I wanna buy you a Christmas gift and it costs $5. Can I have $5? So she gives me $5, I bought the gift and placed it under the tree. But even though the source of that gift was my grandmother and the gift was back to her, was she blessed? She was mightily, enormously, and wonderfully blessed. And the same is true that even though Father, Heavenly Father, deposits love in our heart, when we love him back with that love, he is blessed. Amen? Okay. So kind of moving on to some new things then today. Some would argue, or not argue necessarily, uh, contentiously, but some would posit the question, why is the first commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and only secondly to love our neighbor as ourselves? God is uncreated. He is love. He knows no lack or deficiency. Why would we invest first love in God and not our neighbor, especially when he's the source of love? That's a fair question. But the divine order really does matter. I have a couple of word pictures or statements that I hope we'll get at it a little bit. Remember that passage in the New Testament about the 10 virgins and five had oil in their lamps and five did not? The point of that is that five had cultivated intimacy with God. And in cultivating intimacy or first love with God, oil's being deposited in their lamp. So that when they go out to burn bright in ministry, they're not burning a smoldering wick, but they're burning true oil. And that's a far better model of ministry than just burning a smoldering wick with no oil to give it flame, right? And so that's one way that we talk about it uh, is that oil precedes the burning lamp of ministry. And ministry is directed towards others, you know. Intimacy or worship is directed vertically towards the Lord. Sometimes I like to say that intimacy with God precedes impact on our neighbors. Amen? Another way that we say it, and some people turn this into a false dichotomy, so hear me carefully. We seek his face before his hand. Now, some people say we should seek his face and never his hand. That's actually legalism, false religion, asceticism. We need his hand outstretched on our behalf and on behalf of our neighbor, don't we? That's absolutely legitimate to ask God to stretch forth his hand and heal. But the point is that we want to first uh, touch his face, the, 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 the light of his countenance upon us, the, um, that God would make his face to shine upon us as we gaze at him. And secondly, to see him extend his hand in horizontal ministry. How else could we say it? 
Um, I like to say it this way, is that worship, and we actually get the Old Testament picture of this in a number of places. What often preceded a decisive, gory military battle? Worship. Worship before warfare. Uh, another way I could say it is David's poetry preceded his, his power. David's harp out there on the hillsides, David's harp preceded his sling in five stones. Do you see those kind of ideas in scripture? Let me try and say it one. Uh, God before man is the divine order. How about this one? Here's another word picture from the New Testament. Just trying to give you a variety of places where we see this. Hey, what are you doing? We could have sold that oil for like a year's wages and given it to the poor. <clears throat> Jesus himself, leave her alone. You always have the poor with you. She's anointing me for my death. Let her pour it out. She breaks the alabaster jar, pours out a year's worth of oil upon the Lord. Fragrance fills the house. But it was the idea that it's okay to lavish on the Lord, that the Lord comes even before the poor of the land, that if we're not in right connection with him that loves the poor, we'll never really have an effective ministry. And isn't it interesting, the one that raised umbrage about, hey, we could have sold this and given it to the poor, is the very one that in scripture was said to be stealing from the from the coffers, and that's true. The Bible tells us that he used to help himself to the money in the coffers that was used as alms for the poor. He wasn't sincere in what he said. I think this is maybe the best word picture, or at least the one that works best for me, because both are important. We know that both are important. The first commandment is important to love the Lord our God. We know the second commandment is important, to love our neighbor. And in so many ways, they're inextricable or they can't be pulled apart. But every once in a while, we get a word picture where we see at least the precedent or the order of things. And Mary and Martha, do you remember that story from scripture? Mary was serving with all her strength. She wanted to do right. She loved the Lord, serving with all her strength, distracted, the Bible says, about many things. And Mary, who also served and who also loved the Lord, rather than go in the kitchen and make sandwiches, sat at the Lord's feet. And the point is, is that Mary sitting takes priority over Martha's serving in that specific context. It doesn't mean we never serve. It doesn't mean that after a time of sitting at Jesus' feet, Mary wouldn't have gotten up and started helping in the kitchen. But there was room at the Lord's feet for both Mary and Martha in that time. And the kitchen at that time could have waited as he was offering instead a meal to them, the food of eternal life, amen? amen. We choose Mary sitting before Martha's serving. Here's one final one I can think of. Remember at the judgment where a number of people said, Lord, when did we see you naked, poor, hungry? I forget the whole list, you know, of different things, sick or in prison, when? And he says, well, every time you didn't do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. But more importantly, it's what he said, because they said we were doing mighty ministry we were casting out devils. We were holding big crusades. We were healing people. We were doing all kinds of things. I mixed up my stories here. It's more to the point. We were doing all these things in horizontal ministry at a high level, Lord God. We have big crowds. And we have big names and reputations for you. And Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. You did all those things on a horizontal level outside of intimacy with me. And you never did them before me and from a place of my heart or dependence on me. And he ultimately says, I never knew you. Now that's a stark dichotomy 
But the point is that we always need to favor intimacy before impact. Amen? And I'll get to some other reasons why that's important. Finally, if you just turn to one more scripture as a scripture reading today, we'll look at it in Mark, though we see it in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Uh, it's Mark chapter 12, verse 30. The Lord himself speaking, if you have a red letter edition, these words are in red. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the most, I didn't read that first part. This is the most important. And then in verse 31, and second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no greater commandments than these. The point of saying that we're to love the Lord, our God, with all our, what's the order again, that he, heart, soul, mind, strength. I just, I want to be careful because some of you are, detail oriented but sometimes in going into great detail we miss the what's the phrase the forest for the trees mm -hmm. we just want to make sure that we first catch the forest here when it says love me with all your heart all your soul all your mind and your strength the big picture there is it's Jesus is just emphasizing through repetition love me with all that you are Love me with everything that you are. Love me with your whole being, not compartmentalized. Love me with all your faculties, with your members, with your resources, with all that you are. Love me. And that's the big point. I do think that to, in order to get at the sense of holistic or comprehensive love, it's sometimes helpful to tease out those four words. Why can't I ever remember? Heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so I think there's tons of overlap, and I'm not even sure I'm characterizing them accurately when I do this, but I do know that they all serve the most important point, and that's that we're to love God with all that we are. But I do think they kind of break out this way. So the first one we'll mention for some detail would be that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart. When I look at different commentators and just lay this word before my own heart, I'm inclined to think of this primarily as our emotions and our affections, that we're to love him with our desires. Um, trust in, is a trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Where was I wanting the desire verse? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The emotions or our affections. Now, this is what's interesting about loving the Lord our God with all our heart is that we can't, scientists tell us this, and important pastors and theologians tell us this, and I've never really thought about it until recently, but they say we can't just change our emotions on a dime. We can't necessarily will our emotions to change. That it takes something else. It takes other inputs in order to change our emotions. We can have effect on what we think about, what we dwell upon, but we can't change the emotional aspect of that. And so we can't change emotions without changing what we're gazing upon or the inputs that we take. And what's really amazing is that, um, I'm ad-libbing here, so bear with me. Um, 
This goes all the way back to high school. I almost never watch movies in general, not as a legalism or anything. I just don't find movies that enjoyable. But back in high school, I remember going on a, on a double date and we went to a scare movie, a horror movie. And I remember sitting there thinking like, I know this isn't real, I know this movie is a movie. And I'm sitting next to my girlfriend and my friend sitting next to his girlfriend and everything's fine. And we're gonna go out to eat afterwards and it's great. So it's just all great. But watching that movie and absorbing all that through my ears and my eyes and letting my heart perceive it, you feel these like, you know, if someone pops up behind you at the right moment, you, you know, it affects us. Even when we know it's not objectively true, it has an impact on our emotions. And so it's absolutely important what we set before our eyes. What did Job say? This is ad lib too of it. I'm thinking Job said he made a covenant, strong word, strong word, made a covenant with his eyes. And in his case, not to look upon a maiden, but not to look, which maybe was his area of weakness, not to look lustfully at the opposite sex or any unclean thing. In other places, I think someone says that they made a covenant not to look at any unclean thing. But the point is that we have to be careful what our eyes see. Amen? Yeah. How would I characterize this one in two different ways that we can love God with all our heart? If you want to turn there, I'll just kind of... Uh, paraphrase these, but if you want to turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. I said before, I might have said in the last sermon that I think if there's one pitch or one scripture that encapsulates the idea of sanctification, that is growing in progressive holiness. In, in progressive holiness or, or righteousness or putting to death sin and taking on right attitudes and actions. I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But I want you to see the process by which it works. And it says that we gaze, we, we gaze imperfectly. I think it says through a mirror. And that would have been an, old, an ancient mirror that would have been a little bit fuzzy. But that's part of the power of this is even though you don't see perfectly clearly when you gaze at Jesus and you still have questions unanswered and there's things we won't know till heaven, if we gaze on him, but even a little bit, even where it's fuzzy, it has the power to change us from one degree of glory to another. And that is the very heart and essence of sanctification the same glory that we become what Peter calls becoming partakers of the divine nature. And so a big part of loving the Lord our God with all our heart is setting the right kinds of things before our heart. And the number one thing to set before our heart are the virtues and attributes and beauty of God Him. Self. We see uh, one other, I, I could think of a number of scriptures, but I just want to give you at least a couple for each one that kind of point to this idea. David in Psalm 27, verse 4. This is the David that is no longer in the adult years and in the cave and running from Saul's spears. This is the David that, you know, the girls sang songs about. Saul has killed his thousands. David's killed his tens of thousands. That was a song, a popular hit way back in ancient Israel. So David's got all this adoration. He's in a palace. He's been mighty in exploits. But in the midst of all that, is he distracted? His number one thing, even in all that, is one thing. I desire the Lord 
that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to gaze, I just love this phrase, and to gaze upon the beauty or the excellencies or the virtues or the attributes of God all the days of my life and to inquire in his temple. And so David is saying that even when I got all this other stuff, I just want to make sure that I keep filling my heart with the ultimate picture of beauty, which is God himself. And that's transformative in our own heart. Seems like I'm leaving something out there, but I'm gonna move on to the second one, the soul. Loving God with all of our soul. Oftentimes we say of soul, mind, will, and emotions, but that's why I say I think that the overall text to love the Lord our God is trying to be give us a sense of comprehension because other aspects of how we're to love him are usually incorporated in the word soul. In any event, here I think specifically in a limited sense, soul doesn't mean emotions and soul doesn't mean um, our mind. Those are kind of listed separately. Soul here, I think, means our will. It's our personality, our will, our identity, that we would love him with um, our individuality, if you will. Let me try and uh, get at this a little better. It would mean that we define our worth and our success so one of the ways we love God is by defining our worth and our success by kingdom virtues and not the world or the culture we live in. And let me say it a little more uh, colorfully with this next statement. The cultural, the ultimate cultural value, no matter how well it gets disguised, the ultimate, ultimate cult, cultural value is more, bigger, better, faster, leaner, meaner now. That is how I like to describe, no matter how well it's disguised and how, no matter how pretty a face or lipstick is put on it, the cultural value is more, bigger, better, faster, leaner, meaner now. But that's not kingdom value. That's not the kingdom value. The kingdom value is so different from that. Kingdom value is humility, right? Can't do it apart from you, God. Humility has a whole lot less to do about boasting. Boasting is its own separate thing. Humility is best determined by am I, depend, am I depending on God or am I acting independently of him? That's a better way to get at humility. In any event, kingdom values are humility, the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Um, my mind just went blank, and it's the only one I can think of right now. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those are kingdom values, right? And kingdom value is, and this is a scriptural quote from one of the minor prophets, not despising the day of small beginnings. To love the Lord our God with all our soul, I think this scripture kind of gets at it. Psalm 84, verse 10. This will be a very rough paraphrase because I can only really think for sure about the word doorkeeper. But I, it's something to the effect of I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to share spoils or riches with the wicked. Now, something to that effect. But I think that's the essence of loving the Lord with all our soul. I'd re I, I would rather... I would rather spend my life unrecognized and as a lowly doorkeeper in your kingdom and by your values than to be somebody in the cultural milieu. 
Another one would be this way. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40. And Jesus was commending a certain group of people who live such a lowly life, lowly in a good way, lowly in the way of humility, lowly in the way that they weren't beating their chest and sounding the horn and looking for attention, that when Jesus actually went to praise them and did praise them, they said, Lord, why did we do that? And he says, every time you did it for one of the least of these, it was, I counted it as if you were doing it to me. Every time you did it for the least, I counted it as loving me. And we see that in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. So to love him with all our soul has a lot to do with our will and that we would will to love him according to the values of his kingdom and not the world's culture. Amen. Now, a third one is that we would love the Lord with all our mind. I've been spending a lot more time personally thinking about this one over the last 100 days or so. Not that I'll say more about it, but to love the Lord our God with all our mind uh, I think is pretty straightforward. It means that we would love the Lord with our thoughts and we would love the Lord with our imagination because we can use our imagination two ways, right? We can use our imagination in a sanctified way or in a um, doubtful, dark way, right? That we would love the Lord our God with our thoughts, imagination, and truth. And there's two different ways that we would love the Lord our God related to our mind is that we need to be active in denouncing the devil because the devil is constantly trying to bombard our minds with lies. And he'll tell us lies about ourselves, but if you unpack virtually any lie of Satan, you know who he's ultimately lying about? He's lying about God. Did God really say? Hath God really said? God knows that when you eat of it, you'll be like him. He's trying to keep you from something. No, Satan is constantly trying to lie to us about God. And so we need to constantly be vigilant, alert, watchful in denouncing the lies. And I get... It just works better for me to, to do this. When a lie comes into my mind, you know, assuming I'm in a situation where I can do this without creating a scene, I just stop and I say, Lord, or, or I do three, I usually say three things. It's a bit of a formula, but it works for me. I say, Lord, soul, devil, it is that is a lie, whatever it happens to be, it is written, you know, and then, and I can't think of a specific one right now, but I kind of just work through that. But I actively make sure that I'm denouncing the lie, that I'm rejecting the lie, that I'm removing all agreement with it. Because in one of the reasons I say that is, and one of the reasons I think I got caught up short over the last hundred days is because I think a lot of lies were coming in and I'd just say, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to deal with you. But I think by not dealing with them, they ultimately like, whoa, I wake up one morning and it's like, I got a stronghold there and take me down, discourage me, bring me down. And I just had to go back and do like a hundred days work of removing those negative lies and just kind of systematically taking away agreement with them. But it's a powerful thing. We need to renounce the lies of Satan in some active way. It doesn't necessarily have to be with words or according to a certain formula, but we would do well when we identify a lie to reject it, renounce it. And one way that we can be helpful, this would be, Second commandment, love. But my wife will do this for me and will in ministry do it for others and just will sometimes break in on a person and say, 
that's a lie. You're believing a lie. Wait, you know, snap out of it, wake up. I take authority over that lie in the name of Jesus, you know, whatever it might happen to be. And so we love the Lord with our mind, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We cast down negative imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We make it obedient to the word Christ. Amen? Another way that we love the Lord our God with all our mind is Colossians 3.16. One of the other beautiful 3.16s, there's several of them, not just John 3.16, but Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. And one of the ways that we love God, because, you know, it's like, how do I love you with my mind? Lord, well, one of the ways that we love the Lord, that he counts it as love towards him, is when we take his word and we meditate on it and we gaze upon it and let it dwell richly within us. Amen? I mean, that is a, I guess when I'm trying to break these down into practice, that is loving God with your mind. And the third one is this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. I'm going to turn there on this one. I always forget some of the specifics, but it's a beautiful idea. I used to call this the Hallmark movie verse, but I'm told that even Hallmark movies have changed, I'm told. Um, what is that again, Bones, for Phil when you're trying to find something in the Philippians, Galatians? Greeks eat pork chops. Gentiles eat, Gentiles eat pork chops. And girls eat popcorn. And girls eat popcorn. That was the one I had, yeah. So what and I'm so I'm looking for popcorn. Okay, here, Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 8. I just want you to see, like, this is an exhortation, but this is a way of loving God. How do I love you with my mind, Lord? Uh, I'm sending loving thoughts towards you. You know, it, it breaks down for us if it doesn't get really practical. But this is a practical way that God counts us as loving him with our mind. Finally, brothers... Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. When Natalie was home, I said I don't watch many movies, uh, but when Natalie was home for Christmas, it's just one way of hanging out and interacting with her. There was maybe about 10 days there where we watched a movie every night. And when I do watch a movie, you know, my buddy Sherpa, you know, it's usually a smash em up movie. It's a, you know, something like that, or, you know, a cowboy movie or something, but I just, I kind of wanted to practice this verse a little bit. I wanted to set something before my eyes that was a little different. So every time she would ask for a movie, I'd say, Natalie, G or PG or like a family story or something, something about a horse, you know, that and a little boy that loves the horse or a little girl that it's like, Natalie, that's my, that's my range. That's my limit. You know, like I want something like that even though it's not what I would naturally, but what I found over the course of the 10 days is I kind of looked forward to the next movie about a little boy that loved a horse. 
because it fits the definition of whatever is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent. And the point is that by when we actually set those things before our heart, they change us. And we begin to want and desire the very thing that we're setting our affections upon. Changed from glory to glory. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. And finally we love with our strength. To love with our strength is to love with our time, our talent, our treasure, our energy, and our resources. The most uh, basic way that I unpack the idea of loving with our strength. You know, so again, how do I love God with all my strength? Do I sit and like do uh, weightlifting poses up to him? You know? <laughs> It needs to be worked out practically because you do kind of get stymied. It's like, Lord, I get it. I want to love you with all that I am. I want to love you with my heart. I want to love you with my mind. I want to love you with my soul. I want to love you with my strength. How do I do that, though? Well, we do it in really practical ways. And one of the most practical ways that we love with our strength is according to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. This is just like the best summary statement of loving the Lord our God with our strength. And the way that we love the Lord our God with our strength, whether it's in the arena of our time, people say this, by the way, just a, a little shout out for time. People say health is wealth. There, there's truth in that. Time is life. Time is life. It's a big deal. That we would love with our time, our talent, our treasure, our energy, our resources. How do we do that practically? How do we love God with those things? We love him in those areas by discerning what's seed corn and what's corn for flour or corn for grinding and corn for bread or seed for bread and seed for sowing. Whether it's in the arena of time, God, you've given me just like everybody else, 24 seven. What part of that time is for sowing into the life of others, <clears throat> sowing into the kingdom, sowing into my kids, my wife, the congregation, neighbors, community, whatever it might happen to be. What part of my time is for sowing into someone else? What part of my time is for consuming, for recreation, going on a walk, reading a book, personal devotions, etc.? What part of my talent, you know, is for serving others? What part of my talent is for working my job or, you know, whatever, I'm not breaking it out well. What part of the money that you've given me is for sowing back into the kingdom? What part is for paying bills and putting kids through college or, you know, whatever? Same with our resources, same with our energy. And so we just ever want to be discerning of what you have given us in all those arenas. Lord, by definition, a certain portion is for sowing. And I'm not going to try and tell you what that is right now, but just a certain amount of that is for sowing. And a certain amount of that is for consuming. And we just want to make sure that we discern the difference, right? Because if we eat our seed corn, we'll never have a harvest. And we can live without a harvest maybe because food is fairly plentiful and we could beg, borrow, and steal it from someone else, not steal. We could beg or borrow it from someone else. But what's really at stake if we don't sow our seed corn it's what the Bible calls a harvest of righteousness. We'll never get another way. 
except by sowing what he has given us to sow. Loving God with all of our strength is ultimately showing our dependence on him. One of the reasons that we fast, by the way, that we calculatedly fast, calculated fasting is making ourselves temporarily weak by calculation. But by making ourselves weak by withholding food, it, it, it really is a powerful thing. I hate when fasting is kind of reduced to like super Christians because the beauty in fasting is not that we earn something for God in a way that we can't get through prayer or something else. Here's the beauty of fasting. When I fast, I'm more tired, I'm more cranky, life is harder to do. And it just instantly reminds me, that's right, I can't do life on my own. I'm dependent on you, help me God. That's the beauty of fasting is it shows us our dependence on God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 calls it to show the surpassing power belongs to God. So we love with all our heart. We love with all our soul. We love with all our mind. We love with all our strength. We love with all that we are. Again, Heavenly Father, as I close, um, yours is a paradoxical kingdom. It's, it's a kingdom of seeming contradictions. We want to love you more and with all our heart and with all our soul with all our mind and all our strength, might, and resources. But we know that we'll never do that if we don't first come to know and believe the love that you have for us. And so I pray that more and more you would reveal to us the love that you have for us as your children and that as we recognize that and receive that and experience that and believe it, that our hearts and our minds and our souls and our strength would overflow back in love to you and to our neighbor and for your glory. Amen. The Lord be with you today.